studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Uh, congratulations. This is, as Joe Biden would say, a big deal. Hmm. <laughs> well, I, um, yes, it is a big deal. Uh, when I first found out about it, I thought something was wrong. Uh, so I, I called people I knew who might be able to tell me how things like this happened yeah. because I was very suspicious, uh, feeling completely unworthy. Uh, and, and we tracked down the process by which a person is selected and considered. And so it took me about two weeks yeah. to become satisfied that there was, and excuse the word, legitimacy to, to this. Uh, I still don't feel that way, but at least I know uh, to my great satisfaction that money didn't change hands. Uh, my family is thrilled <laughs> <Yes>. and delighted. <laughs> and based on my family's yeah. uh, enthusiasm, then I, uh, can, can live with this. This includes Harry? Harry doesn't know, doesn't care. He, he, <laughs> the idea of going to the White House, I think, will really get his attention. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the rest of the family couldn't mm -hmm. be more thrilled. Uh, so to me, that's reason enough and uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't be happier and more grateful to the, to the folks who made this mistake. I mean, it's a really classy group to be associated with. As you mentioned, Johnny Carson, mm -hmm. you were yeah. there for that. I was there for that night, and uh, I, I remember uh, I was to follow Ted Koppel, and it was the first of uh, many times I had to follow Ted Koppel, and that's not where you want to be, because he is very, very funny. And as I said that night, it, uh, maybe a little too funny for a newsman. Yeah. And this was, gosh, 90, I don't know, way, way back, long time ago, 94, something mm -hmm. like that. One of your guests tonight is one of the funniest newsmen we've ever seen. Well, yeah, Brian business. Williams, <coughs> he, he is uh, pretty, uh, pretty facile, uh, pleasant fellow, uh, very, very knowledgeable, very, very smart, and maybe funnier than everything else he is. And <laughs> Wait, Meaning that he's funnier than, he's a good newsman, he's funnier than anything else he does? He, Yes, it, it, he probably is what they're looking for for this job or for uh, the, the comparable job at NBC or any other job. This, is, this, is, this guy is a real throwback. Yeah. I mean, uh, many guys are smart and knowledgeable, yourself included, uh, and, and you're, you're funny enough, <laughs> but, but Brian Williams, I is mean, this, this guy is a triple threat. Yeah. Might he want to do something like that? Uh, I, I would hope so. I think, I think he's honestly, between you and me, wasting his time doing the news. <laughs> that's, a de that's a dead end job. <laughs> but there's also this. You get this award, and there have been others, but for 30 plus years of doing something you love. Right. That's a nice way to go. Well, it is. Uh, and uh, I, I think how fortunate people are when, when you know what you want to do, and then you find a way to do it, and then you continue to do it mm -hmm. for as long as you want, that's great good luck. That's great good luck because I think, uh, and I know, a, a lot of people never really quite mm -hmm. sure what they want to do, They're not really quite sure what path they want to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and maybe they make themselves happy with whatever path they end up on. But there was no question in my mind from the time I was 17 what I wanted to do. And I've pretty much done it every day of my life, everything I've ever wanted to do. And uh, I, start, I was on television when I was in 1968. Yeah. So I've been doing this a long time, and it's, it's still just fun. I mean, it, all it is is just showing off. You bring in a bunch of people <laughs> yes. who, who really don't want to be here, yeah. and uh, watch me, I'm going to show and, and, off. And talk to some of your friends and, and hope they'll be entertained. Yeah, well, we, we've been very lucky with... Uh, people who come to see us. Uh, there's a story that, that you really were, didn't know what you wanted to do, didn't particularly like college that much, and then you took a public speaking course, mm -hmm. and you said, that this is it. it. That was it. This it was is it. it. It was in, uh, actually in high school, my sophomore year in high school, and uh, my peer group uh, was following a, a, an academic course of study. I was having trouble with the academic course of study, and uh, as they c continued successfully on the academic course, and I was taking more and more shop classes, uh, yeah. I was being pulled away from my peer group, and I started to panic because 
these are the guys that I liked and spent time with and emulated, and they were going away <clears throat> while I was learning how to solder. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but it was I could just see that I was going to be in some trouble. And then I took this uh, speech class in, in high school, my sophomore year, and uh, the first project, the first day of school, was we had to get up and give an extemporaneous five-minute talk about ourselves. And I did that, and, and everything else changed. And I said, well, geez, this is really what I want to do. Now the trick will be to find out if you can make money with yeah. five-minute extemporaneous speeches. Uh, but what was it about that that made you say, wow? I don't know. It was, it, uh, I, well, well I, I, I do know. It, it, nothing in my life ever went well. This, this went surprisingly well and couldn't have been easier. So the combination of getting rewarded for something that's easy to do, I mean, mm. there you go, you're, you're writing your own paycheck, aren't you? At some point you get in a pickup truck and you drive out to Los Angeles. Right. You look around and you see the comedy store, and three years later, you're sitting next to Johnny Carson. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> it was 1975, uh, and uh, it's like the Jodes. We're, we're heading west. Yeah. And, but, but as I've said before, it was so easy yeah. because if you owned a television set and you watched The Tonight Show, once a week, twice a week, you would see comics. And before or after each comic, Johnny would say, you can see so-and-so and so-and-so uh, at the at comedy, the comedy store. store. Yeah. And you'd have to be stupid to overlook that connection. So I told everybody that I, I wanted to be a writer, <laughs> but I didn't really want to be a writer. And because then, you didn't want to admit that you wanted to be that's right. in that's front right. of the camera. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to make a, too big a fool of myself. Uh, and the first week we got out there, uh, I went to the comedy store. And, and how was that first performance? Scary, really scary. But the, the woman, uh, Mitzi Shore, uh, to whom I owe a great debt and, and a lot of other men and women owe a great debt, uh, was kind enough to ask me if I wanted to come back. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I, then she had me emceeing, which was perfect, because I had no material and you could just Introduce uh, the other in, act. Introduce the other act and make fun of drunks in the audience. <laughs> but you got to hang out with people who were doing what you wanted oh, to do. Oh, yeah, it was tremendous. I mean, it was so great because uh, every night you would, you would get to try out your material. But the best part was then seeing people that became your friends uh, and watching them work. And, and it was uh, my good friend George Miller and my friend Tom Dreesen and, and uh, Jeff Altman and, and then Robin Williams and Jay Leno and... Uh, Johnny Dark and on and on and on mm -hmm. guys men and women that maybe you've heard of uh, some that you haven't but they were all really funny uh, funnier than I ever was and to, to go to work and knowing you were gonna spend the night laughing and then the camaraderie was uh, always entertaining too. Carson meant what to you? Well uh, for a person in that situation he meant everything uh, I mean it was uh, it wasn't like it is now. The, the door to being a stand-up comedy or television success was The Tonight Show, the curtains mm. through which you pass to be on The Tonight Show. And he meant everything to me, he meant everything to everybody else who was out there doing stand-up. Uh, it was the, the time when you could be on that show, do well on The Tonight Show. The next day you would get calls about having your own show, you would get calls yes. about uh, auditioning, William Morris wanted you and and they're going to put you on a show, and then there's a movie and a this and somebody. And in those days, people would go out on tour for like six, eight months, and they'd have an opening act. So it was really the employment placement office. And more often than not, if, if Johnny liked you, uh, you were going to trend upward on a, on a pretty steep The incline. most powerful influence on your life, you think? For, for, first, for that reason. And yeah. second, because... Yeah. He was the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Yes, the most powerful influence, certainly professionally. And, and I used to think as, as a kid watching him uh, in, in the Midwest in Indianapolis and, and uh, you know, my dad would be there in his underwear and, and I'd be there in my pajamas and we'd be watching Johnny Carson. And uh, Johnny was like, oh, geez, uh, you know, I love my dad, but Johnny's a little hipper than my dad. Uh, and so Johnny kind of became a guy, you know. Yeah. This is what you do if you're a guy. When's the last time you saw him alive? Uh, it was uh, uh, years, and go years ago. Uh, he and his wife were in town on their, on their boat. Uh, 
and they invited me and my wife to have dinner with them, and we sailed up and down the Hudson. We went under the uh, George Washington Bridge, turned around, came up, back uh, past the lower, looked right at the Statue of Liberty, and then up the East River, turned around and came back. And it was all at sunset, and it was magical. He walked away from it. Could you walk away from it? Yeah, yeah. Think so? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think he, I think you would always. I, oh, I know Johnny missed it because, uh, like six months after he retired, somebody had a big party for him in New York, and he'd won some sort of an award, and people got up and uh, did material, and I had to get up and do material, and that damn Ted Koppel was there, <laughs> uh, and then Johnny got up, uh, and and Johnny, who had not been on television for six months or a year. Bang, 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 right down like he'd had not missed a beat, uh, stuff out of the newspaper, bang, 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 bang. And at some point during that, he says, uh, he said, I'm so glad uh, this is going well. He says, I sure do miss it. So I know he missed it, and I, I know I would miss it, but I'd find uh, other things to do. Uh, there have been other dramatic events in your life. One is you go to the hospital and then tell you you're going to be on the operating room. Mm -hmm. You go in, the same doctor I had, and... Wayne Isom, Carl Wayne Krieger, Isom. and those guys. Yeah, yeah. those guys, and they, and they fixed you up. Mm -hmm. Did that change you? Well, um, going into that, I was a, a, a really, uh, like a black belt hypochondriac. Yeah. I mean, really. Uh, I mean, self-diagnosis, uh, self-medication. I, I had two different doctors ask me to stop coming to their office. <laughs> they said, we can't no. find anything yes. wrong. Yes. Stop coming here. But, but you were convinced something was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then when you have a quintuple bypass surgery, yeah. that, that really makes your hypochondria look silly. <laughs> so that all changed. Yes. Uh, and I, I guess the, the people say, well, what did you learn? And and I had to think long and hard about it, but what I learned then was you really have to trust people because these guys are so good. And, you know, you don't know that before you're in their hands. No. I didn't know that before I was in their hands, but they're so good. Uh, and to this day, we have quite a few friends from, from that episode. So it was a, it was a life-changing Nice experience. tribute to them. You brought them all on stage. Oh, yeah, well, they were keen. And uh, uh, we still, Donna Riley, who was... Uh, uh, Wayne well, Isom's right-hand person. Oh, my God. More, yeah. more than uh, Wayne's right-hand, Wayne's left-hand, Wayne's brains, right. everything. She's tremendous. When you go through that, does it change your attitude about work? Does it change your attitude about mortality? Does it no, change it didn't your change attitude? my attitude about mortality, but it did change my attitude about work because uh, from the minute they pulled the, uh, the tube out, the intubator or whatever they call oh, it. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I thought, geez, I wonder if I can still work again. Uh, so it, it, uh, it, it, in a movie, it would be where uh, the prize fighter who gets knocked down, it would be the montage where he then tries to get back in shape to get another shot at the title. So I was worried that I wouldn't be able to work again. So uh, it, it kind of relit the fuse of, well, let me see if I can do this. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why you leave Indianapolis in a pickup truck, because you want to see if you can do it. <laughs> yes. so, so now, yes. oh, geez, I want to see if I can still do this. And you did, but there are stories that, that you became mellow, more charming. <laughs> 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 that, you, that you weren't quite, you know, as you had been. Uh... I mean, a guy whose life, entire life, was this show. Right. Because it had defined well, what you loved doing, you yeah. wanted to do it better, and you didn't know what there would be if it wasn't there. Yeah. Well, irrespective of what I just said, uh, one of the things, uh, a regret I have, I don't know if it could have been any other way, but a regret I have was not being so single-minded about this show. Uh, and I, and I think what it is, in, in my case, the two great motivators in my life, uh, and I hate it when people start talking about two great motivators in my life. Uh, one is the, the uh, guilt. Yeah. I'm really haunted by guilt. Um, actual guilt, made up guilt, you know. And the, the other would be the fear of failure. Because 
if, if I don't succeed, me loading the pickup truck in Indianapolis in 1975 looks pretty silly. Yes. So, so success defined that as the right thing to do. Yeah, but I, I wish I had, uh, I think it came at a price. I, I mean, the, the heart surgery being one of them. But I, I wish I hadn't been so gosh darn single-minded because it, it, uh, when, when your focus is that tight, uh, you miss a lot of what's going on around you. Might you have had a child before? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I just thought uh, uh, when the topic would come up, I can't, I can't do both. Uh, I, I can't try to have a successful television show and be a father. Uh, and I was wrong about that uh, because as difficult as being a father is, it's entirely complementary with everything else in your life. How is that? Well, you just, you, you know, it's, it's like you, you get your prescription updated. You, oh, you can see <laughs> yes. things that you never saw before. And you think of things other than yourself. You think of things other than yourself and, and you recognize, uh, and, and all of this is, anybody who's had, had kids it says through, this. goes through the same thing. <laughs> but, I, you know, I wish I, I wish I had yeah. like five or six kids. Do you really? Well, no. Uh, I just say that because I think people will like to hear <laughs> no, it. No, you do. You like it. I mean, to I read would, everything you've ever said about a, this, I you I love. Girl. What? I wish I, I have a little boy now. No. I wish I had a little girl. Really? Yeah. Never too late, is it? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you got a better shot than I do. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> but it tra changed your life. I mean, you have said a number of times. Yeah. This kid made you see everything differently. Made you see everything different. But what I wasn't prepared for was the infinite anxiety that it triggers. You, you worry uh, about everything. Yeah. I don't care. Just throw out a topic, right. go through the alphabet, <laughs> identify a, a word that begins with any letter that could be trouble. You worry about it. That it could happen to your son. Happen to your son, could happen to you. You could yeah. do something. It just, mm. it's, it's endless. It's the old, uh, you know, don't, don't, run with that, uh, don't run with the screwdriver. And now I see my kid <laughs> run. I say, oh, God. Let it go. He's let running it go. with yeah. the screwdriver. How, how did that happen? Yeah. Are you best friends? My son and I? Yeah. No. 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 He, uh, <laughs> no. And you're, people say, well, you know, you, you don't want to be your best friend. You want to be his father. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know what kind of father yeah. I am. I, you I, don't know. I don't know. I who does, does anybody know? Well, I don't know. See, if I had more than one kid, then you would know. Yeah. Because you would learn so much from the first experience that you could apply it, you could edit your mistakes and, and refine it for your subsequent mm. kids. But uh, he, he takes full force of the good and the bad. Mm. You, there was a moment in which you had, I mean, you worried about things and, and you had a certain battle with depression, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we found out medication can go a long way. Yes, uh, uh, and, and always qu quite skeptical about it. And uh, my uh, friend and doctor Lou Aroni, twenty years ago, he said, "You you should, you should take something for this." It w and I said, "No," because I thought it would make me mm -hmm. loopy or make me hallucinate or make me drowsy. Uh, and he said, "I'm telling you, just try it ten milligrams." So I I went through. Uh, I had the shingles really bad. Oh boy! And uh, part of the concoction of, of drugs they give you to fight that pain um, y y y are pretty serious. Right. And I just got tired of taking them, so I stopped taking cold them. turkey. Yeah, yeah. And uh, part of that created in me this uh, nervous anxiety, and then I was really screwed. So that's when I said to Lou, "Okay, okay, I'll, I'll try anything just to get rid of this this depression because it was." It's, it's different than, oh, I don't feel good today. It's different than feeling sad. It's different than yeah. feeling blue. It's, it's really, like a friend of mine says, it's, it's, it's the world with 20-20 vision. You really see yourself in trouble. So I, I took it, uh, 10 milligrams, and uh, one of those uh, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Right, right. SSRIs. Yeah, mean. yeah. And, uh, oh, my gosh, uh, within about 90 days, uh, I realized, oh, this is how other people who I admire must feel. Because I would, I, whenever I would get upset, I wanted to make sure the world was upset mm -hmm. with me. And the smart people didn't fall for that. Uh, and, and when I started the, the, that medication, I realized, oh, you don't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. There's another way to live. And, and I think it's, uh, for me, it's the right way. I, I, I don't know what causes it. Some people get it 
in, in bigger amounts. Some people get it in lesser amounts. I don't know whether it's trauma. I don't know whether it's just the luck of the draw, but it certainly helped me. We sit here in the Ed Sullivan Theater. Uh, CBS came to you and Howard Stringer uh, after they decided to go with Jay for the Tonight Show. Um, can you look at that now and say that was for the best? Uh, yes, absolutely for the best. And, and when, I, when I look at that now, I think it also uh, reminds me of some of the worst uh, behavior of my life, my own behavior. Uh, and I wish things were like they are now. I wish they were like they are now then. And what was the worst behavior? Well, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of self-imposed pressure, a lot of actual pressure. I mean, they came in and remodeled this place, uh, which I've grown to love dearly. Huge amounts of money. We had to fly around the country, talk to skeptical uh, affiliates, and um, I, I didn't handle it well. Uh, and I wish I were able to handle it the way I handle things now. But it was insecurity, anger? In, insecurity, anger, fear of failure, uh, e e everything. All that's gone now? I would say it's all gone, but it's, it's in, in, in a manageable dose. I, I, I just feel like this is the way humans really ought to be. I, I mean, I still lose my temper. Uh, and you're this close, Charlie. I'm telling That's you, right. you are this close. Let me you know, know when I get I mean? even closer. I will closer. mop the floor with you. <laughs> That'll make this one of the more interesting <laughs> interviews I've ever done, right there. So what is it you think that you brought? Uh, you created this show, which followed um, a previous show, where you had sort of, in the eyes of many, redefined comedy. Because it couldn't be what John was doing. All right. It had to be something else. Yeah. You didn't want to have his guest on your show. Well, we couldn't. We were, we were told as a prohibition, you can't do this, you can't have the same guest, you can't have an orchestra, right. and on and on and on. Uh, but uh, I had very little to do with that. It was the, the people that uh, on, the sh on the staff, they were resourceful enough and figured out ways. You know, they kind of said, good, that's not the show we want to do anyway. Right. And, and I always felt like I was lucky enough to do somebody else's show you know they built the show and I did it and it, you know when we started out the, the producer and the head writer and uh, was was Meryl Marker right. and so we kind of did her show and then after that we did uh, uh, Steve O'Donnell show who was another head writer and then Rob Burnett was our head writer for a long time when we did his show uh, and I liked the fact that these people were all smarter and funnier than I was because you know, I don't. I don't. Is this know what just self-deprecation, or you actually believe that? I, I, I think it's true. They were I doing their show rather than true. your show. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah, and it, and it's a, it's a great relief because you then learn from them while they're doing it, and then you can complement what they're doing, or uh, personalize it to make yourself fit in. Well, here's the interesting thing, and this is you know this whole notion of the Kennedy Honors is recognizing something about your contribution. What Johnny Carson meant to you, you mean to Jimmy Kimmel and others. And do you have any sense of that? I mean, do you well, appreciate that? You know, that? Jimmy Kimmel is a case, and he's been very nice to me. He's a, a nice kid and been very gracious to me. And um, to the point where it's made me self-conscious. And I start thinking about what this is and yeah. the comparison that he had made that uh, you are to me what Carson right. was to you. And the difference is, uh, all I really have is tenure. Uh, Carson was head and shoulders beyond anybody doing it now, anybody who will, who will ever do it. You may see flashes of what he could do, but if you look at his show, it was always effortless. Even, even shows that were awful, yeah. you just wanted to see what Johnny was doing. I, I don't have that. Like I said, all I have is uh, time. Tenure. I've put, in, I've put in my time. I don't, oh, I can't more bring than that, Dave. I, 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 I don't, I don't you, know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one to argue about this because I don't understand comedy, but at the same time, you know, it's self-evident that what, after you, people looked at these shows differently. And therefore, right. Fallon like I, and like Kimmel I said, and... I, I, I believe that may be true. More than but tenure, though. There was something no, about I, the, the eccentricity of whatever it was. I think it was the vision of the people that I had around me more than me. Yeah. I mean, we all knew that the charge was to be a different show. Uh, and in the beginning, I will admit that I thought I had all the answers for television. And I 
<laughs> you, you had that attitude. Watch out, world. Exactly. I'm coming. Yeah, said, or if you can wait just a little longer, we'll take care of television. <laughs> That's right. And then, we'll do it. Yeah, pretty, we, have, we know the answer. We soon, have the secret. You realize you don't know the answer. So, <laughs> the sauce is not there every night. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know if I can rightly, you know, I was in the room. I'll give yeah. you that. I was in the room. And how have you changed in terms of your performance? Well, um, it was certainly less ambitious. You know, I'm, really? I'm, I'm 65, so I'm not going to do things I did when I was 35. Uh, less, not willing to take more risk, or yeah, that's right. Really, that's right. Uh, but I, why is that? I mean, why well, should you I, lose I risk have, at 65? I, I think that when, you, when you're that age, I think uh, the metabolism dictates what's going on. Like. Uh, if, if you said to me, we're going to have a Cirque du Soleil on and they want you to dress up <laughs> yes. uh, like a zebra. That wouldn't happen and, tonight. And, no, it wouldn't happen. And then run down Broadway. Or you can talk to Brian Williams. <laughs> I would find that the conversation with Brian Williams more satisfying. Uh, I, and I think that's just being 65. I can see a kid uh, who's looking to make a mark, mark. in television yeah. and, oh, I've got to do so-and-so and I've got to do so-and-so. But I'm not that anymore. What do the guests that you like share? Brian Williams is one. Tom Brokaw is another. Regis is another. Tom Hanks is another. Mm -hmm. Steve Martin is another. Mm -hmm. Bill Murray. Bill Murray yeah. was the first. Yeah. The first guy right That's here. That's right. Yeah. These are well, these are people that are e easy to admire. Uh, and really smart. Really smart. And uh, that's the other thing. I, I've been around all my life really smart people. And it's, it's a double-edged sword because it's, it's great, but it also makes you realize, oh, geez, I wish I was just 10 percent, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe 15 more points yeah. on the IQ test. Just to, but that's, that's how you learn stuff, you know. And, and uh, to also to be able to make some of these people laugh is, is greatly satisfying because you, they're, In a previous they're conversation funny. with me, you said, I mean, you cannot appreciate, I mean, you cannot understand unless you sit in that chair how you feel the necessity of getting a laugh mm -hmm. every minute. Right. Well, I, that's interesting. I remember when we said that. See, I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I always felt like the, the, the show, I was the, the central nervous system of the show. Yeah. Uh, we have, while my name is in the title of the show, I don't feel that need now. I, I feel like the presence of the guest uh, can can handle that just fine. Um, somebody else can get a laugh, or we can go without a laugh. Now, I would prefer a laugh comes from someplace, but I, but I don't feel that ultimately the, that weight is on my shoulders anymore. Is what makes you laugh different today? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, no, I think what makes me laugh today is the same thing that's always made me laugh. Something uh, silly, really silly, but yet still within the range of plausibility. Yeah. Something that, yeah, that maybe could happen. We don't think so, but maybe it could happen, but it's so very silly. And, that, and that's all it takes. You love somebody pushes back, though. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. these smart people come in here and that's they right. push back. That's right. You know, if that, they that's, the, yeah, that's pretty good, yeah. yeah. But it's also the fact that if they come prepared. I mm -hmm. mean, you like the guy. I mean, I flew back across the country with Tom Hanks one day, and he was going to be on the show. He was thinking about appearing with you for five minutes, mm -hmm. preoccupied with it, yeah, because he wanted it to be perfect. Right. Well, he's he's a tremendous guy, and he for him to take my show that seriously, that's high praise. Mm -hmm. And he he mentioned it when he was here uh, last week. He said, "Well, the uh, the you know the ten most uh, anxiety, sweaty filled minutes of my life are over." And, and I know he takes it seriously. And all yeah. he re he's so charming as a guy, he doesn't need to prepare anything, you know. But uh, I, I, I love that because it shows me that one of the really greats uh, thinks enough of my show to, to feel that way about Steve it. Steve Martin feels the same way. Steve Martin, it, Steve Martin it, I, I mean, here's a guy, you know, genius, just in many multiple, multiple faceted genius. Anything you wanted to do that you haven't done? I mean, you nope. failed at certain things. Nope. Yep. No. Uh, done it. Done everything. Hon honestly, it, it's not like. I mean, when this goes away, I will miss it, but I it, it, I won't have those moments where I think, oh. If I'd only. 
dang, we never got to yeah. do this. Yeah. Do you come, when you, when you come to the show every day now, I mean, are you less, I mean, you're less anxious to do it, not only, and, and you don't want to go to meetings about it. I mean, you're not, is there a risk at some point you will just mail it in and will you know oh, then that this I, is a time? I've been mailing it in for years, Charlie. <laughs> uh, I can't go to meetings. I, I yeah. just, I finally realized uh, they were producing great anxiety. I can't pay attention. I think I have one of those disorders. Uh, I hate going to meetings. Attention I hate yeah. deficit disorder. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. when people start saying yeah. the same thing over again, I think and yeah. say, well, you know, geez, we just covered that. So I don't go to the meetings, and I think it's for the, for the better. You're fresher and better. Yeah. Uh, some days I get very excited when I see that a certain guest is going to be yeah. on, uh, and then, then I'll really look forward to that. Um, so that's all good. Uh, the, the other night when, uh, because of Hurricane Sandy, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, ask people to come in here as audiences, uh, I kind of got excited about that because See, that's great I mean you got excited about the fact that you went out and said there's no audience mm -hmm. yeah I wanted to see what that was like yeah uh, and then we did it two nights in a row and, and that was good to do it one night would have been no good because then the second night I knew what to expect and then okay so we did that mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I look forward to that I mean I'm sorry for the circumstances obviously yeah. but, but it was a new challenge mm-hmm yeah. Finally, I mean, there's a sense that for a while you were a loner. A loner. A loner. Would you, you <laughs> a drifter. <laughs> a man wanted in several states. That's right. A man, a, a man who would get in his Porsche and drive up there yeah. at speeds beyond yeah. light. Yeah. Uh, but also a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> a man who had multiple a personalities. With, a man who had an obsession with owning lots of land <laughs> in yeah. Montana sure. and St. Yeah. Bards and everywhere else. Collected you jars of his own urine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to. Well, thank you. you. Honestly, I, I'm so uh, grateful. And I just want to say, uh, in in the beginning when we came here, I was uh, really difficult uh, for the network. I regret that behavior. And over the years, uh, people like yourself and the management have been nothing uh, but kind to me, and I appreciate that. Because we love you. Oh. <laughs> uh, congratulations Thank again. Thank you, sir. This is a high honor. Kennedy honorees, how does that sound? Big. <laughs> impressive. Very impressive. The president and the first lady will be there. Half of Washington officialdom will be there. And when you think about it, so many of the great musicians, um, it's a really special honor. Hmm. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we're British, too. So, and no, uh, I was going to yeah. say, um, although uh, McCartney's been. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, these years that fly by, you know, we got together so many years ago that, uh, and for zest and, and uh, adrenaline and energy, we, we had the years that we had together. Yeah. And then so many years later, these people s sort of sum it all up and say, okay, um, we, we remember them, which mm -hmm. is magnificent, mm -hmm. really. When did the critics take notice? Well, they didn't like us at all. I know. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they understood what we were doing. What and, didn't they yeah. understand? Um, I, um, I think they probably were um, reviewing albums, uh, relative to bands that had singles out as well, and so they, they would make that very um, identifiable, if you like. Each singles would be identifiable to the sound of a band, the character of it. We didn't do that. So, so we were pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to get right over the horizon musically. So uh, I think they, they would have trouble because of what they wouldn't have a point of reference that they could take from either the first album or, or if they're doing the second yeah. album, and certainly by the time they're trying to review the third album, in a very short time, I might add, as well, because they're up against a deadline. Of pub well, and also there's a reverential thing about um, <clears throat> white kids playing blues, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, you had great people here um, with Mike Bloomfield, Elvin Bishop, Canned Heat, people who were actually bringing back Skip James and Sun House out of obscurity. Yeah. And we came along and we mutilated the blues and twisted it upside down. And um, <clears throat> I guess it was considered to be bad taste too, you know. I think there was a feeling that we were slightly precocious and not being 
sticking to the act, trying to emulate what it was in the first place. And the worst thing in the world with music is to keep it going identical forever yeah. and ever. But was that a driving thing for you guys wanting, let's turn it all upside down. Let's do what we hear and turn it upside down. Well, I, think, I do think we turned it upside down. Oh, you clearly down. did, but is that I, what you intended to do? I think we did because the way that acoustic music was being presented yeah. wasn't, was in a way that hadn't been presented before. And so it, it wasn't just, it, it wasn't, even though there's a, there's a common denominator in us with the blues, um, we were presenting we were presenting music that had influences from all over the place, really. Yeah. But it was but it was a way that it was crafted together. Yeah, people. And, go ahead. Well, as a singer, you can't actually get anywhere near the initial delivery of those great recordings, which weren't part of a plan. They weren't somebody looking after their career interests. They were people expressing themselves. And so, for me to come along and try and sing, you know, <clears throat> like Robert Johnson or uh, B.B. King or, or Buddy Guy, first time yeah. I met the blues, yeah. you know. Uh, mm. How could you hope to be a guy from the middle of England and get anywhere near that as a, as a presentation? It was a pointless exercise. It just wouldn't be part of the agenda at all. So it's just about getting it on. And I was 20, John was 22, and Jimmy was 23 or whatever it was. So you didn't have this kind of need to be purists or whatever. Was there a leader? <laughs> among you? Was there first among equals? Well, Jimmy was in charge uh, uh, with the crafting initially and with mm. the, the nous, the understanding <clears throat> and all that. So, and Bonzo and I were really just couldn't believe it. He got the extra money for driving the van <laughs> and uh, I got some penicillin yeah. and we were feeling pretty good about all that stuff, you know. Um, and going back and telling all those people who kept crossing the road to avoid us, that you know something was going on uh, as time went on we matured a little bit from the middle of england and we played a different role as as things developed did it keep getting better for a long time yeah, yeah. yeah. creatively yeah the response what response we played bigger and bigger yeah venues which i must admit i've I wasn't that keen on the really big venues because you l I always felt that you lost a lot of the, s mm. of the subtlety in the band. Everything had to be just broad gestures. Yeah. And whilst it's great that a lot of people can see you, you know, there's, to me that wasn't what the band was about. I don't think we ever managed to uh, supply the demand if, you, if we're talking about concerts. We always sold out yeah. and we were always doing multiples in cities, mm. but then we'd have to be moving on. Um, we all, that's it, we always had full attendance everywhere and from the early days, those very early humble days, in say 69 when we were really, really touring and establishing from one coast to the other, from, from the west coast to the east, I mean that was it, in a matter of months we were, we were really established, but the people just kept wanting to come and see us, you know, more and more and more in droves yeah. and that never stopped. <clears throat> no, the event became the event. And we were trying to play with the same sort of inter, inter, interaction in the middle of an event which people come for for different reasons. So it was, a, it was an event, it was a far out experience. Um, and I understood that because I had my own places to go for events too, you know. But sometimes it did get in the event and the response within the event got in the way of what we were doing, I thought. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So we couldn't really... I mean, the great thing about what happened in 2007 when we played together again was that we were back, even though we were in a reasonable sized venue, we were close together, really listening intensely and intently to the interplay between the four of us with John's son playing, you know. Yeah. And that was exactly kind of how we'd started off, you know. London 2007, yeah. at that concert. Yeah. You wanted to show you still had the right stuff. You could do it. Tell me more about that moment and when you knew that and why it became, for everybody there, an extraordinary evening. What well, was it we, about if, the music? If we were going to do it with the massive reputation that preceded us, that we'd have to go out there and get it right and we'd have to work on it and, 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 and really come together and be so collective about the, the willpower to come, you know, to, 
to make this into, if we were going to do it at all, it had to be the best concert. And we also had an opportunity here to be able to sort of have a retrospect on our own career, to, to, to select the, the, uh, the various numbers that were going to be in the set. And it was, a, it was a perfect opportunity to go out there, stand up and be counted, and show why we were who we were. But it needed some work to be done on it. Obviously, we needed to rehearse. We couldn't take this in a really flippant way. We had to really commit it, to it. And as it was happening, could you feel it and sense it? Did you know it? Well, it got more relaxed and more fun. Uh, by song number three, I think we knew that <clears throat> we weren't going to, we were on it. I mean, the thing is, we set a huge bunch of standards for ourselves with every time we, we cut records, we were trying to be inventive <coughs> and we, we weren't trying to supersede anybody else's gig. We were doing our own stuff. But it was still uh, rather like this wind that's blowing through here. It was, um, <laughs> it was certainly something to live up Somebody to. Somebody close the door. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck what? Berry would say, a Chuck cool would say, breeze. Yeah. A cool breeze. Yeah. yeah. OK, so after so this. So it's living up to that, getting yeah. it right, and not faking it, and not being some kind of plastic. But you knew you had it. This was the magic. We got it well, going. Well, plus we had Jason in the equation yeah. here as well. Jason had come to uh, yeah, John's and we'd, son. And we'd, and we'd known him as Jason, Jason the, the kid, you know, John, John's son. Yeah. But, you know, it was one rehearsal, and, and we all knew he was Jason, the man who was really tearing at the bit. You know, he had so much enthusiasm yeah. to... And, and there was such a will between all of us to really make this... It, to not saying to make it work, it was working but to make it even better than that. And everybody in the world knew it. So why did you not take Led Zeppelin on tour? What you know about Led Zeppelin is you're interviewing us now, you interview lots of people, you, you, they're interesting shows, but you have to be creative and imaginative and move on. And I think the great essence of, of Led Zeppelin is the creativity and the imagination that develop with each project. And a project is a project. It's not just going back and visiting the past. It's moving forward. And I think that we don't, I don't see us being a stadium actor or whatever it is going round and round, making everybody feel great playing the hits or whatever they are. I hear that as part of a big picture of what we were once capable of. And that's the reason we came to America. We played new songs, and we did what we did, and we took songs that made the audience go, wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. Do I like that? And three years later, they'd say, yeah, I like that. And that whole creative thing is really what musicians, for me, live for. But if you recaptured that, why couldn't it continue and be creative and, and engaged and, yeah, and even more so? Why well, You didn't know that it couldn't build from where it was in 2007, well, even maybe, though it had some relationship to the past a lot hmm. it could be about the future couldn't it jimmy you wanted well, to go on tour no, 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 didn't no, no, you, look, it was didn't you want to go on well, tour wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute it's 2007 that we did it right so you got one year that passes two years that pass three years that pass four years that pass we're coming into the fifth year hmm. so you know that's a long while five years is quite a long while hmm. in five years uh, uh, it, you know, in the whole sort of world of Led Zeppelin from 1968, we've done a lot. Yeah. Mm. That's, a, that's a long time to be missing time, you know? But, but it is said that it was you, that you had developed this other interest and that you did not want to do it. No, I want to do great creative things. And these guys are my buddies. They're my friends. We're soul partners in a big chunk of our creative lives together. And I think that's a wonderful thing to have experienced. And if that can be the kind of uh, melding of just hanging out together long enough to find out if we all know what key we think in, that's yeah. great. I mean, but it's ever onward. And John's busy, right. Jimmy's busy, right. we're all busy. And it's not the be all and end all of everything. It's just what we love and what we may love in the future. What would have been going forward that was not a tour that would have been good for you guys, well, that, good for us, good for music. It's difficult to say. I mean, is a tour necessarily good for music? Well, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> or good for us in that, in that way. Okay, um, so a tour's good for me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. We all had to be of the same mind to do it. I yeah. think. And, and you weren't. And, and I don't think we were. Mm. And that would have that would have been hard. But everybody got along, didn't they? You essentially were. It was the music in the end for you guys, and that kept you together, even though you had that car accident in Greece and had to take some time off. Mm. Had to interrupt the tour. Yeah, yeah. It was a wheelchair year. Yeah. Or so. yeah. yeah. Mm. Even more tragically, you lost your son, and you just did what any father has to do: is grapple with that loss and forget well, everything else. There are priorities in life beyond being a, an entertainer. You know, there are a lot of things that are much more important, um, and and we are very lucky that the gods have given us the gift to be to do what we do. But we do many other things, you know, and uh, and time seems to. I don't know what you think, Jim, but I think time gallops now. Yeah, I did. Don't you find that? Yes, I it, see, it does. I once do. upon a time, if we could make Zeppelin one in 36 hours, you know, 36 hours now seems to be like the blink of an eye. I want to hear you tell me what happened that night and why mm. something didn't go forward from that night. Because what was a Led Zeppelin was magical. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it and it is. is. It, it is. Well, yes, it is. And it should these are great moments this is a great time we're exactly. going there we're going to see some very very um, hard-working conscientious people who are trying to put this country back on its feet exactly. and mm. I love that's brilliant that we should be in the right company mm. we are I mean for me I'm absolutely mm. uh, I'm so pleased that everything is where it's supposed to be in the great wheel that turns here in America long way to go but we're entertainers. If we can entertain each other, we can entertain somebody else. It seems a reverence for the music, so, and the fact that the four of you had something that you discovered that was so special. When something happened, you, you, you just had to stop. Mm, you couldn't really? go on. You couldn't mm. go find another singer. Mm. You know, it didn't work. You thought about that. It we couldn't go and work. find another drummer. Another drummer, that's another drummer. Yeah, yeah, until Jason. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you didn't have another guitarist. I mean, you had the world's greatest guitarist with you. That's you, right. You know, it's amazing, really, when you think about it, with uh, Bonzo and with Jason. I mean, it was another reason that the, that that gig was so important was that Jason had always been on the on the periphery of everything, goading us about a particular thing, the way that it was played in a particular venue on a particular yeah. date, on a particular bootleg. Oh, yeah, <laughs> 25 years ago, when he was in diapers, you know, or yeah. what, actually, no, he's in diapers now. Um, and uh, <laughs> so it was only right and, and meet and just, and the great thing was that Bonzo's mom was still around to see it, you know, yeah. mm. and Joan yeah. was there and she was uh, in her lace and taffeta uh, having a great night <laughs> mm. and the, the occasional on odd sherry. Uh, so that was another great fait accompli, really, in the, in the middle yeah. of it all. So, but when John died, it had to be over. Well, it was crucial. Well, it was four piece. Over. It was a four piece yes. band. Yeah. You know, it was a four piece band that, when it toured, each concert had different different elements to it from the night before. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. the night that was going to be in front of it, and so it was constantly changing. We had this, you know, yeah. we had this whole. We'd, we'd built up this whole sort of elevation, really, to how we played, and, 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 and synchronicity and connection, that to actually, once you lost one of those four members, uh, and at the time that like we did, there was no way you could bring somebody in and rehearse, rehearse pieces that went from bootlegs or sound tapes or whatever, to say, well, we did it like this, like you were yeah. saying, in 1975, can you do a bit of that along with what we did here in 1977? You know, the whole, the, the whole thing would, would have been so disconnected that it would have been impossible to actually be able to play and not see John Bonham there. And whilst it was great what Jason did, it was, for that performance, certainly based on what his father had done before him. And he took loads of chances, and yeah. he was a star that night, yeah. Jason. But it was still built on, 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 on the foundations of what his, his father had done. Mm. What's great about mm. that is you can now buy the DVD and see what it was like. Yeah. And feel it on that day. And there yeah. were great moments of even in all that what I was talking about about moving on, being futuristic between 
ourselves or with other people that we work with or whatever it is. There were moments within that set where we were risking it. These guys were risking it and trying new bits and pieces. And if it had fallen on its face, I guess we'd have had to cut it out of the film or whatever. Mm. And we didn't even know there was going to be a film. We just, yeah. you know, it was like, oh, here we go, let's do this. Did you believe in your brain and your heart and your bones that we are the best band alive? No, I think within what yeah. we were doing, we were pretty insular. There was a lot of bands from England who were playing stuff. There was a lot of bands from everywhere. They knew it. But they were all great. You're being everybody, too, you know yeah. what? You're just being too <laughs> self no, everybody knows. You're being too something. I think everybody's good. That's why they do it. They, they celebrate together, all these yeah. different people who were playing. Yeah. But at the same time, all of us would like to have been you. See, the elements yeah. of Led Zeppelin is you can, you can hear it. <laughs> Not <laughs> you, always. You, you, no, wait a minute. Yeah. But yeah. when you listen to it, you can hear what each individual person is yeah. putting into that mm. and how two will be bonding with two and two here and three and all four. And it's just this weave. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that is the thing, I think, which is musically helped the longevity of it because it's such a textbook for young musicians. But, uh, yeah, I, the, the, I, would, I would say, you know, without being conceited here, that, yeah, it was the best band. We all were working no for it band. to be the best band. And, I mean, and other bands said that to us yeah. anyway, you know, our peers. So. But also, I mean, as an individual musician in that band, when I went on stage, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to show everybody how good I am. I thought, I'm going to show everybody how good Led Zeppelin was and work towards that. Make, the whole thing was to make, do everything you, good to, uh, everything you could to make that performance really special and the band sound fantastic. I couldn't get over the fact that I was hanging out with Janis Joplin and people like that and they were encouraging me. You know, so many times my voice used to pack up and Janis used to bring me tinctures and um, all legal. But like, try this orange juice, which of course was laced with absolutely everything you could get to wreck your voice. Yeah. And it was great, this fraternity of, of, of lunacy that was like, it kind of, that's the, that was the payoff for me, was this, the fraternity of uh, musicians and the stuff that you couldn't find in Britain no matter what, you know. Those festivals that we played, we were the best band at what we played. But round the corner came John Lee Hooker with his band, yeah. and round the corner came Pacific Gas and Electric, whoop, and uh, <laughs> it was just a great time. Mm. Kennedy Honors, uh, you stand where remarkable people have stood and, and you well deserve to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.